Hello everybody! In this video, I will revisit the partial fraction expansion, but this time we use a different technique and we will try to utilize the residue theorem. Okay, so uh, in my opinion, residue theorem is easy to apply uh, for uh, many cases, uh, especially in the, the type of problems that you will encounter in the midterm, but you will decide on which method to use based on your experience and, and your practice. Okay, so we have an uh, RLC circuit. Okay, we have resistors, inductor, and capacitance. Input is the voltage source, and it's given that it is a step type of input, which means that V S of T is equal to one volt for for okay, sorry for that. Okay, for T is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, output for this problem is given as the inductor current, which is equal to I. I already derived the transfer function. You can do it by yourself uh, at home. Okay, uh, and if we technically take the Laplace transform of the input, we will know that it is a one over s. So I of s, which is the output current, is equal to twenty four divided by s times s plus three and s plus five. So this is the final expression of the inductor current. Okay, and we want to compute the time domain expression of the inductor current. Okay, what I will do, or what we will do, is Partial fraction expansion. Okay, since we have s, s plus 3, and s plus 3, they are just simple first order roots, we can divide it um, into three pieces a divided by s, b divided by s plus 3, c divided by s plus 5. So, what you can do, you can technically use the method that is uh, provided in the previous videos, but now we will use a different technique. What we will do is we will try to isolate a from b and c, and then b from a and c. With this isolation and we will hope that it will be uh, easier to compute individual components okay so i will do a trick i will multiply both sides with s okay why i multiply with s because i have s here so if i do that this is equal to one i have bs and cs okay that's great so let's assume that i equate s equal to zero in both sides okay so here i have s equal to zero and s equal to zero this is zero this is zero this is a okay so what i did is i found the way such that i can compute a without computing b and c so a is equal to technical limit s goes to zero s times i of s okay so what is s times i of s this is 24 divided by s plus 3 times s plus 5. So a is equal to 24 divided by 3 times 5. This should be equal to, okay, so this is ugly. This is 5. I think it's equal to 8 divided by 5. Okay, it should be correct. That's great. That's correct. So we computed a, as you can see, without computing b and c. This is one of the main uh, advantages of this method. We can compute individual components without knowing the whole components. Okay, so we will do the same trick for B. So multiply with S plus three, okay? So if I multiply this part with S plus three, this will be just B, S plus, okay? So S plus three, S plus three, if I, equate both sides to where s is going to minus 3 i will obtain that this is going to 0 this is going to 0 this is going to b so b is equal to technically uh, i of s times s plus 3 okay so 24 divided by s s plus 5 where i should replace s with minus 3 and it is equal to 24 minus 3 times to I guess so it should be equal to minus four or something like that. Okay, that's great. So if I do the same trick to C, I will obtain that C is equal to twelve divided by five. Okay, so as you can see, if you have single first order roots, if they're not repeated, you can isolate them from the remaining part of the Laplace transform expression. This is so powerful. Okay. If we generalize this for a general, uh, okay, so before generalization, uh, since we compute A, B, and C, 
I have this component. What I can do is I take the inverse Laplace to find the full time domain expression 8 divided by 5 plus minus 4 e to the power minus 3 plus 12 divided by 5 e to the power minus 5t. Okay, cool. So let's go back to generalization for non repeated roots. Okay, so if y of s has a non repeated root, which is states that I have an expression like this a divided by s minus p and remaining expression of x of s. And if one of our x p, okay, take the instead of s p, so that's going to be, is not equal to zero, which means that if x of s doesn't have a root at p, then I can compute a using the simple expression. Limit s going, s is going to p, s minus p times y of s. Okay, so in general, computation of uh, coefficients with residual term is much much easier than other methods okay but uh, this is true for non-repeated roots okay actually you can use technique for complex conjugate roots also but since you have also a complex conjugate uh, you need to uh, deal with some complex algebra which may not be very handy or simple in many cases so uh, i can say that if you have complex conjugate roots uh, both methods are equally wrong are equally hard so I don't isolate them, but if you have a single root, okay, it's a real root, then this method is super easy. It, technically, you can use residue term. Okay, so let's uh, have a different problem. Okay, and now we have a repeated root. And the problem is all poles are repeated. So s equal to 0, s equal to minus 1, I have a repeated root. If I put the poles in map, I have repeated root here, repeated root here. Okay, so if I write the partial fraction expansion, uh, expression, it will be look like this, right? A1 divided by S plus A2 divided by S squared, E1 divided by S plus 1, and B2 divided by S plus 1 squared. Okay, so let's try to do the same trick, and if it works or not, we will see. So, multiply with S, okay? This should be 1, that's great, okay? So, this should be 1. This should be 1, okay, this is S, this is S. Then let's equate S to 0, S is equal to 0, A1, this is 0, this is 0, but this is going to infinity, so we blow the expression. So multiplying with S didn't help, so we cannot directly apply the previous technique here, okay? So let's change the approach, okay, let's try something else. Instead of multiply S, let's multiply with s to the power 2. Okay, this goes. This is s. This is 1. s square. s square. Okay, now if I multiply, replace s with 0. This is 0. This is 0. This is 0. So let's change the color or let's do that. Okay, as you can see. I isolated A2. So I can multiply A2 or compute A2 very easily using this expression limit s goes to 0 s square times y of s. Okay, that's great. So it's true. So I computed A2 and as you can see it is equal to 1 if I do the expression because so I multiply with s squared 1 or s plus 2 1 over s plus 1 square, so s is equal to 0, it's equal to 1. That's great, but, okay, so I want more, because I want to compute a1. Uh, how I can do that? Uh, I will go to b1, b2 later. Still, let's multiply with s square. It's a good start. Okay, that's great, s square. This goes to, let's say, this is 1. I have s here. This is 1 s square s square that's great let's call it uh, let's say z of s okay uh, what i want to do is i want to take the derivative of z of s with respect to s okay d over d of s z of s is equal to technically derivative of this what is a1 times s its derivative is a1 a2, it's a constant, it's derivative is equal to 0. Okay. If I take the derivative of this, it should be something like that. S times some expression. 
it will be the same thing. If I take derivative with s, there should be still some s with some expression. Okay, so if I replace s with 0, this will go to 0, this will go to 0, I will isolate a1. So it's great. So in order to compute a1, what I can do is, I can take the derivative of this expression. Okay, and of course I need more. So a1 then limit as s goes to 0. Now I found a way to isolate a1 from all of the other coefficients. And if I take the derivative, I will find this expression. If I take the limit, I will obtain that I, a1 is equal to minus 2. Okay, that's great. Okay. So, I compute A1 and I compute A2, so we will technically do the same thing for B2 and B1. Okay, so let's remember to B2. In order to compute B2, what we will do is, we take the limit. S should go to minus 1 because we have a bullet minus 1. I should multiply Y of S with S plus 1 square. Take the limit. If I do that, it will be equal to 1. Okay, for, for B1, what I will do is, if we follow the same trick, limit s going to minus 1, okay, d over d of s, s plus 1 squared times y of s. If I take this limit, if I compute all of the coefficients, it will be equal to 2. If I finalize my partial fraction expansion, it will look like this. Okay, so as you can see, if you have a repeated root, the computation is still easy. Okay, there is a generalization of FSG theorem for higher order terms, like third order, fourth order, but I never ask third order or fourth order uh, repeated roots in midterms. Okay, so you don't need to memorize them or you don't need to look at them. So understanding first order and uh, second order or double root case uh, is enough for uh, midterms and uh, for practically solving problems that can uh, technically uh, come into front of you uh, in uh, this course environment. Okay, so if I compute y of t, let's compute that. So this is step function minus 2. This is ramp function t. Okay, this is exponential 2 times e to the power minus t plus it is since repeated, I need to multiply with t e to the power minus t. It should be correct. It should be, it is correct as you can see. Okay, so let's generalize it and let's look at the case. So if we have a repeated root, okay, which means that in the partial fraction expansion, I have two components associated with p, b1 divided by s minus p, first order part, and second order part, b2 divided by s minus p squared. And I should have other remaining terms, but I know that x of s doesn't have a pole or root at s is equal to p. So 1 over xp cannot be equal to 0. Okay, so if it is the case, it means that I have an isolated repeated root and I compute B2 and B1 easily using this rigid theorem based formulas. Okay, that's it uh, that I want to talk about you today. So there are two techniques you learned how to take the inverse Laplace of an expression. Okay, so one of them is a more direct method where you need to do some algebra. Okay, the second one is you technically isolate some parts from others with the help of residual theorem and you can compute inverse Laplace with an easier approach.